Welcome to Carnegie's Spring 2021 season uh, virtual lecture series, which features our own Carnegie scientists as well as other world leading scientists and provide them with the opportunity to share their work with our community, with you, uh, friends, supporters, and science enthusiasts. The series has been designed to give you an intimate and behind the scenes look at our scientists in their work environment. And we're really excited about uh, how this public outreach and, and explaining these programs to you will help make science accessible to everybody in the entire community. So today we're fortunate uh, to be hearing from uh, Dr. Johanna Teske, who recently joined us as a staff scientist at our Earth and Planets Laboratory. And although Joanna came uh, to us last September, she has actually been working at Carnegie since 2014, first as a, our inaugural Carnegie Erogens postdoc and then uh, as a NASA Hubble fellow. Johanna earned her PhD in astronomy from the University of Arizona and her bachelor's degree in physics from American University right here in DC. Johanna's research, as you'll hear about, aims to understand the processes of planetary formation and to explain why, interestingly, there is such a very large diversity of planetary architectures among the many observed solar systems. She uses data from our own telescopes at Las Campanas Observatory, as well as some of the space-based telescopes like NASA's Transiting Exoplanet Satellite Surveyor, TESS, uh, to explore the interior and atmospheric compositions of planets, exoplanets, and their chemical environments during the formation. So how did they form? What material was there when they formed? So by looking at their host stars, you can learn about this. Her work is also interesting in that it could help us to identify candidates from among the thousands of planets, exoplanets in particular, that we have already observed, um, observing what conditions might, might give rise to host life uh, as we understand it. Johanna has played a role in, uh, in recently in a collaboration with colleagues at the Earth and Planets Lab with Carnegie's observatories, MIT, and other scientists from around the world, where they made some notable discoveries uh, with TESS, including, uh, amongst many, including the first Earth-sized exoplanet, as well as a cold super-Earth orbiting Barnard star, which is, as many of you know, it's the second closest star to our sun. For the past two years, Johanna has been involved in a collaboration with Sharon Wang, who also is a former Carnegie postdoc and is now at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Uh, and they've been looking at uh, test data in an effort to study uh, known planets between the size of Earth and the size of Neptune, so-called super-Earth and sub-Neptune uh, planets. Uh, Neptune, just for information, is about four times the size of Earth, the diameter of Earth. And um, what's interesting is that while the size range for exoplanets seems to be very common in the planets we can observe, exoplanets we can observe, they're missing from our own solar system. And this mystery is the subject of her program today, and I'm eager to hear more. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Johanna Teske. Johanna? Great, thank you. So I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to get to talk to you um, today about my research, as Eric said, studying small planets around other stars to learn more about what factors impact um, their formation pathway and where that pathway um, splits or diverges. Oops, let's see. There we go. <laughs> I want to acknowledge, of course, Carnegie, uh, but also NASA for financially supporting this work, um, along with the rest of my amazing collaborators, some of whom are shown here, um, including Sharon, who uh, Eric mentioned, and she and Angie Wolfgang are my co-eyes on this, this work. First, just to get everyone on the same page, I want to motivate a little bit why you should care about small planets, uh, and by that I mean those between the size of Earth and Neptune and talk a little bit about how we're learning about these planets. Uh, then I'll briefly describe my main research effort right now, which is a statistical survey of these small planets to learn more about their compositions and what that implies for their formation. Finally, I'll outline what I think are some interesting next steps to further our understanding of this population of planets and, and how they form. All right, so to set the stage, here I'm showing exoplanet orbital period in days um, on the x-axis, 
versus uh, the planet radii in Earth radii or uh, planet mass in Earth masses. And the different colors of the points don't matter so much right now. Those are different detection techniques that I'll talk about in a moment. But as you can see, we know of this large and diverse sample of exoplanets around other stars. Um, but the ones that we found so far are not very uh, much like the planets in our solar system, which are those orange uh, points on this plot. So uh, like most scientists, um, we like to categorize things, put them into bins. And so these are some of the, the bins that we've put exoplanets in so far. And the missing planets that I'm referring to in my title are, as Eric said, these mini or sub-Neptunes and the super-Earths. And they fall in between the, the ocean worlds and ice giants and the rocky worlds. So what makes this population interesting? Uh, as you sort of uh, inferred from, from the last slide, uh, these planets fit into the space between rocky and ice giant worlds, unlike anything detected, at least so far, in our solar system. We know from the Kepler Space Telescope, uh, which is what um, these data are from, that small planets are indeed the most common. So this is a, a plot of planet radii on the, the x-axis versus the frequency of planets. And you can see from the Jupiter size up to the smaller ones, it, it increases. Um, but you can also see that these planets naturally fall into these two subgroups as defined by this kind of um, gap or dip in their frequency. And uh, actually this, this diagram has become so um, popular in, in my field that you can now buy stickers of it if you're interested. Um, but really because these planets seem to represent the most common outcome of planet formation, at least at relatively short orbital periods, uh, we should really try to understand the physics and chemistry behind them. And also understanding why most stars do, but our uh, sun does not have this type of planet is important for placing the solar system in context. Now, interestingly, uh, these radius measurements combined with models of um, these planets formation and evolution have been interpreted as suggesting that these small planets have uniformly Earth-like uh, interior composition. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, in these formation and evolution models, um, if um, you assume that the interiors of these planets are dominated by an iron composition, you get <clears throat> a model prediction like this, which doesn't match so well. Uh, if instead you assume a water or ice dominated composition, um, that also doesn't match the observation so well. But a model that assumes a silicate rock dominated interior does the best job at matching this observed um, frequency versus radius plot. Um, and uh, that is also the dominant um, uh, composition of, of Earth's interior. So that's what, what mostly Earth-like um, composition means in this context, sort of a broad brush. But radius might not tell the whole story. So to first order, to um, measure or estimate the composition of a planet, you need to measure its density. Uh, and as you might recall from math class, um, but don't worry, there won't be a quiz, <laughs> the density of a sphere, which we assume planets are, uh, is proportional to the mass divided by the radius to the third power. So we need to understand both of these quantities to start to understand planet composition. Here I've plotted the masses and radii of um, known small planets. The squares in the background are less precise uh, measurements and the circles are the more precise ones. And the bold outline circles actually represent planets in multi-planet systems. Uh, and the color coding is um, something we call insulation flux or how much, um, how much energy the, the planets are getting from their host stars. So you can see from this diagram um, like I said, these are the observations, um, that at a given mass or radius, there is a range in potential bulk compositions, which are represented by um, these theoretical models as shown by the colored uh, dashed and solid curves. So how did this variety come to be? And could that indicate different formation pathways? Finally, um, just to be very upfront, it's still really challenging to even find planets that 
uh, have masses or radii or temperatures that are very similar to Earth. So real Earth analogs are just challenging to find, as I'll describe shortly. But now there are many of these one to three Earth radii planets that we can study in detail uh, and still, still use those to potentially learn whether uh, conditions slightly different than the Earth could still produce habitable environments. So I really think now is the golden age of uh, studying super Earths and sub-Neptune planets to address questions like what are the ratios of rock and water and ice, and you can throw iron in there in these planets, and did they form with those ratios or were they altered over time? And just more generally, what can composition tell us about formation and evolution mechanisms in these planets? So, how do we actually start to learn more about these planets? I'm going to frame this in the context of learning about their compositions, since, um, as Eric said, I'm really interested in the compositional diversity of small planets and how similar or different they might be to the Earth. For interior composition, we get constraints on that bulk or average density if we have measurements of both planet mass and radius, like I, I described on that previous slide. Uh, and so planet masses, I'll start with those, uh, are measured primarily through the radial velocity or Doppler wobble technique, where we observe the very small uh, changes in a star's orbit due to the interaction it has with orbiting planets. So in this figure, um, it's a little bit exaggerated, the scale isn't quite right, but you can see that all, the blue circle is the planet and it's orbiting around the star, but the star also has a small little motion um, around their common center of mass. And in that motion, the star is moving towards and away from us, the observers. Um, and we can actually measure that um, by seeing changes in the star's spectral lines as it moves towards and away from us. So that's what that little rainbow um, represents. And the black, the black lines in that rainbow are um, actually measurements of uh, absorption lines in the star's atmosphere. You might have heard this called the chemical fingerprint of stars. Different atoms and molecules um, cause those, those lines in the stellar spectrum. And usually they um, have very precisely um, determined positions. But if the star is moving, the lines will also move. And we can measure that uh, and detect planets. So just for reference, hot Jupiter's, um, those giant close-in planets uh, have RV signals on the tens to hundreds of meters per second. That's the unit that we use to measure that. Whereas Earth induces a signal of nine centimeters a second on the sun. So much smaller, as I said, Earth analogs are still quite challenging to measure. The main instrument I've been using to make mass measurements is the Planet Finder spectrograph on the Magellan 2 telescope at Las Campanas uh, in Chile, as many of you are probably familiar with. So here are two views of PFS. Uh, the bottom left, uh, that's the side that faces the telescope, and the black box is where um, the light actually comes in. And you can see Jeff Crane and I flushing out the thermal control system and adding more coolant. And in the top movie, this is the other side of the instrument that has a panel that uh, we very occasionally remove, as, as in this um, movie, to work inside the instrument, as we're doing here. So uh, PFS is really one of the world's prime instruments for measuring exoplanet masses, and uh, its role has really only grown in the last few years as we've helped follow up planet detections from um, a new mission that, that Eric mentioned that I'll discuss more in a moment as well. All right, so now that you are experts in measuring planet masses, um, just to, to touch on exoplanet radii, those are primarily measured through the transit technique, uh, which is what was used by the Kepler space uh, mission to find thousands of new planets. And so here, um, the planet passes between the observer and the host star, periodically blocking out a tiny fraction of the stellar light. And if that happens um, in a regular pattern, we can infer the presence of a planet, even though we can't see the planet itself. So for reference, hot Jupiters typically have transit depths around 1%, whereas Earth around the sun has a transit depth of less than 1 hundredth of a percent. Very challenging. Um, and these measurements can be made from the ground um, for large and medium exoplanets, but are often made from space with things like Kepler and its successor, 
the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. And so you can see in this diagram, unlike Kepler um, and its um, kind of cousin mission, the K2 mission, TESS is searching for planets across stars, uh, around stars across the entire sky, uh, and is really focused on finding the closest by systems, which are perfect for more detailed characterization, like I'm interested in doing. Uh, and finally, just taking a step back further, um, we think that the composition of the star around which a planet forms, to some extent, influences the type and or frequency of planets that form. And so we measure these, these stellar compositions, they sort of provide um, the DNA to, to planets. Um, we use that same type of data as we did for the radial velocity, these stellar spectra. And so here I'm showing just a different um, depiction of those going from cooler to hotter stars. Um, and now those black bands are represented by these um, uh, lines in this spectrum. And we can measure the strength of those lines and combine them with models of the stellar atmosphere to derive um, relative atomic and molecular abundance in the, the star and compare those um, to the planets. So, all right, now you know why these planets are interesting and, and how um, basically we, we get um, information about them. So how am I trying to answer those questions about small planets in a robust way? Enter the Magellan Test Survey or MTS, not super creative name, but easy to remember. Um, and practically it uh, involves selecting 30 super Earth and sub Neptune planets from TESS. So things that TESS detects and um, measures the radii of. And then we measure their masses using the planet finder spectrograph um, at Magellan. The motivation behind this survey, uh, though, is not just to find and measure the densities of more small planets, which is great in itself, but we want to dig deeper to investigate um, whether super Earths and sub Neptunes formed along the same or different pathways. Did these planets get um, to have their current sizes due to nature, they're just born differently, or due to nurture, something in their evolution? So we're trying to approach this question by better constraining the empirical, so not, not based on um, theory so much as what's really the data telling us, empirical relationship between these planet masses and radii. Um, and we're also adding three additional dimensions uh, to these, these types of plots that we think could be influencing the planets differently. So you can almost think of this as like another axis uh, coming out of the mass radius plot. So the first of those dimensions is insulation flux, which I mentioned, how much energy the planets are receiving from their host stars which could influence how much um, or how well these planets can hold on to any light volatile um, atmospheres. So that might be something in the nurture category, um, something's changing during their evolution. Um, the second dimension is host star composition, which as I said before, is a rough proxy for um, the composition of the planet building blocks. So, um, where super Earths and sub Neptunes forming out of the same building blocks or different ones. And then the final dimension is system architecture. And by that, I mean uh, other planets in the system that might not be transiting right in front of their host star. So maybe slightly misaligned with the uh, transiting planets uh, or planets that are much farther um, away from the star. We're trying to detect those in our survey as well. And that will help us um, compare super Earth and sub Neptune birth environments and also um, the dynamic histories of these systems. So uh, as I, I hope I've made clear, I'm really excited about um, uh, studying the planets, these planets across these different dimensions, but so are lots of other people actually. So um, what, what's setting our work apart? First, is the number of planets and the amount of and, and quality of data that we're adding to the field. So just to give you a taste of what our RV data look like, here I'm showing um, lots of different fits to the data, which are in pink or yellow points, and then the blue curves are the, the fits to the data. Um, all the numbers don't matter so much. I just wanted to show off um, our, our high quality data, which you can see a little bit better here, looking at the y-axis, um, the errors that we're measuring on these um, individual radial velocities are often at 
the two or even one or even less um, meter per second level. And so that um, it isn't much faster or is even very similar to a uh, typical human walking speed. So we're measuring how much stars wobble due to the planets that orbit them really um, on speeds that are on a human scale, which is pretty amazing. All right, um, second, we actually think that it might not be just the quality and quantity of data, um, but how you observe and analyze it that's gonna make a difference in the conclusions that you draw. So coming back to this plot, um, I used all the same symbols, just focusing on the circles for each of these um, mass and radius measurements. But in reality, most of these come from heterogeneous data uh, with many decisions going into which targets were observed and um, how often and for how long and, and the details of the analysis. And these decisions um, have the potential to bias a study of small planets as a population. So for example, if you miss um, some part of this parameter space because some targets just seem less interesting or less publishable or harder to observe, right? We talked about small, um, cool planets being, being harder to observe. Um, so we might think, looking at a plot like this, we're comparing apples to apples, but in reality, it's more like a fruit basket <laughs> um, with pears and strawberries and bananas. So in the Magellan Test Survey, we are doing our best to keep all um, or as many as possible of these decisions consistent across our whole sample to try to mitigate some of those um, biases such that our study will be at least closer to an apples to apples analysis of small planets, which um, is gonna be important for understanding the true compositional diversity of them. So uh, our survey sort of midpoint results were submitted for publication in November. So hopefully within the next few months, we'll um, see our paper accepted and you'll see a press release about it. So keep your eyes peeled for that. All right, uh, I wanted to end with a preview of what I think are some exciting prospects for moving further along this path towards characterizing small planets. Uh, and so I've been talking about astronomical observations, right? Mass and radius and host star composition. This is a little cartoon that Sharon made to represent um, MTS. But how do we know that we're interpreting those um, very fundamental astronomical observations correctly. So Carnegie has this great strength of interdisciplinary collaboration uh, such that we can calculate or at least estimate more accurate interior compositions um, of these planets by conducting experiments to see how different materials that might be in the planets behave at different temperatures and pressures. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I've showed you different versions of this plot before um, where these colored curves represent different predictions for planet uh, interior compositions, but really they're mostly extrapolations from a very Earth-like um, conditions. So we don't actually know very well how materials behave at this wider range um, of temperatures and pressures that are in the super Earths and sub-Neptunes, meaning that there are these uncertainties associated with these curves that we just don't take into account as astronomers. But luckily, thankfully, my colleagues at EPL are working on the types of experiments that can start to pin down these curves with data, experimental data um, from, from labs here, uh, such that as the astronomical data grows in, in number and precision, we'll be able to more accurately and precisely constrain a planet's composition um, based on these types of, of curves. I'm also, of course, very excited about the increase in exoplanet characterization potential coming to Magellan through new um, astronomical instrumentation. And so you may have heard about um, from Gwen uh, Rudy and Nick Conaderis in a previous Carnegie lecture, this instrument uh, called MIRMOS which really represents a potential leap in technological capabilities to measure many exoplanet atmospheres. So let me break this down. The idea with, with this instrument is to use a new beam shaping diffuser, which is um, the effect of which is shown in this, this plot here, 
which both spreads out and stabilizes starlight. Um, and this type of technology has already been shown to produce space uh, based quality, so like the kind of um, data we can get from space, but using ground um, based observations, um, at least with imaging. Nick's idea, um, or the idea of the Miramas team, is to employ this diffuser technology in a spectrograph uh, for the first time. So not just imaging, but that um, idea of dispersing the light and using also this diffuser. As you may have seen, um, Nick and I just got a Carnegie Venture grant to work with graduate student Jason Williams to build a prototype of Miramas for one of the smaller telescopes at Las Campanas, and we're calling this the Henrietta Project. Um, these types of instruments could greatly increase our capacity for a large yet precise ground-based survey of exoplanet atmospheres, which are gonna be also very important for understanding the formation and evolution of these small planets. So this is kind of a complicated diagram. Let me highlight the things that I think are important. Um, planetary atmospheres can have different origins as shown here. So namely um, primary envelopes that are accreted um, from the, the protosolar nebula as the planet is forming. And then secondary atmospheres, which are outgassed from the interior of the planet. And recent theoretical studies have suggested that both super-Earths and sub-Neptunes may experience interior atmosphere interactions that then influence the observed atmospheric composition and thus give us insight into the underlying um, uh, magma oceans. So this is really exciting for me because the mass and radius uh, measurements are giving us a bulk uh, density but um, by observing the atmosphere, this could be a much more direct window into the interior composition. And so this is really um, the focus of the Carnegie Worlds project being led by Anat Shahar here at, at EPL in which me and lots of, lots of our colleagues are part of. Um, and really the, the goal is to combine the astronomical observations and lab-based experiments to help um, illuminate how planet interiors interact with their atmospheres. And we think this is gonna be really important to um, understand um, in terms of our definition of a habitable planet. All right, as we move into the era of 30 meter class telescopes, it'll be important to develop um, a coordinated approach to best utilize the something like GMT, um, but also uh, our, our existing telescopes, the, like the 6.5 Magellan telescopes. And my colleague um, here at EPL, Paul Butler, has this ongoing planet search program that is already helping to detect small habitable zone planets around our nearest low mass stellar neighbor, so around um, M dwarfs. And um, these are the types of systems that we might be able to um, use um, with the upcoming uh, GMT to measure the starlight reflected off of these planets and deduce the abundances of um, molecules in their atmosphere, maybe even biosignature molecules. So um, we're really well placed at Carnegie to, to lead these types of coordinating observing campaigns. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> looking even more forward, um, all of the insights gained in this prior work can be applied to new detections of those true Earth analog planets, right? Temperate terrestrial planets around um, sun-like stars. And Characterizing these uh, types of planets will really require advances in space-based instrumentation. So you may have heard of um, the James Webb Space Telescope, which should hopefully launch within the next year. But then thinking even beyond that, there are missions um, being studied um, called Louvoir and, and HabEx that would succeed JWST and increase our exoplanet um, characterization potential. But to enable those kind of next next generation space telescopes to make the largest number and, and highest um, quality detections so they um, can observe the yeah, largest number of planets. We want to actually find the planets that they will observe ahead of time. We want them to be um, doing the characterization, not the finding. So a precursor survey for Earth analog planets um, will require uh, extremely precise radio velocity capabilities that frankly haven't really been demonstrated yet from the ground. Um, so this is an active area of research. 
Um, but this instrument plan for GMT called GCLEF um, is one of the instruments that is being built to try to achieve this extreme precision capability. Um, lucky for us, actually the types of stars that um, uh, Louvois or Habax will be surveying for biosignatures, they're all just very nearby and bright so that GMT might not actually uh, be needed to detect these planets. What's really gonna be needed is a lot of telescope time um, and a lot of dedication, which we have at Carnegie. And so I'm part of a team that is um, working on, on ideas to bring GCLEF to Magellan prior to um, GMT being finished. It, it seems like maybe the instrument might be completed before uh, the telescope. And so perhaps if it's at Magellan, we could um, work out the kinks of the instrument and even get to use it for a few years before um, it goes to GMT. So ultimately, I'm interested in, in following this path to see where life exists among all the thousands of exoplanets that we have detected in the Milky Way, and I'm sure we'll detect lots more. Uh, and I'm just thrilled to, to be able to do so at Carnegie EPL. Bringing us back, back to the present, um, today I hope uh, you got excited about these one to three Earth radii planets, um, if you weren't already keen on them. And uh, I described the survey that we're conducting to follow up these planets that were detected by TESS, um, measure their masses with Magellan PFS, uh, and um, expand that mass radius relationship into these three, um, we think, important additional dimensions, um, while at the same time trying to address uh, potential biases from heterogeneous data sets and decisions uh, and get the most um, the most apples to apples results. And then finally, I highlighted uh, these few interesting next steps to take on a pathway towards understanding how um, this, this fascinating population of super Earth and sub Neptune planets form. So with that, I will stop and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. So thank you so much, Johanna, for that really illuminating uh, talk. Um, you did an amazing narrative of what, what I think certainly, and I, you clearly believe is one of the most exciting and uh, rapidly developing areas in astronomy and planetary science. That was really terrific. And of course we have lots of questions. So the way we'll do this is um, I, I've got questions from the audience and I have a few questions of my own and I'll, I'll give those to you um, in various order. So let's start with, um, maybe a somewhat broader question. So, you know, for time immemorial, uh, people thought earth was the center of the universe, way, way back center of the universe. And we were unique in the world. Of course, that evolved, we discovered the universe. We had people like Hubble and others who discovered that, oh, nope, there's a, there's a big universe out there. Um, and um, we became one of billions and billions as Carl Sagan would say. And now we're coming back to this understanding so far that the solar system may be pretty if not unique, distinctive. What is your um, sense of, of that question, right? You know, as we now know about over 4,000 planets, maybe over 500 planetary systems. And you just said that we have a very unusual architecture. So can you say a little bit more about, maybe it's a little bit of a prediction, but also, you know, what instrumentation might be developed to either mm -hmm. bring us back to the real understanding that we're not really that unique, or maybe we are. Can you say a few words about that? Sure. So um, I'll refer back to one of the first diagrams I had in my talk, which is getting at this question, um, because uh, a lot of the planets in our solar system, they're either on the smaller side uh, or they're on the longer orbital period side of things. And so a lot of the technology that we have so far been using to find planets is just um, biased towards bigger and shorter orbital period things. And it just hasn't been possible yet to, to push out um, towards the longer period or push down to the smaller planets. But there are sort of two uh, avenues for doing that um, in the uh, immediate future. So a technique for detecting planets that I didn't talk about is called direct imaging. Uh, and it uh, kind of is what it sounds like. You're taking pictures of systems and, and trying to detect the planets directly versus the impact they have on their stars. And that, um, that's a rapidly advancing area of technological development. And in fact, 
Um, one of the uh, most advanced instruments for doing that is also on one of our Magellan telescopes. Uh, and so that will start to push out farther to detecting kind of more Jupiter analog planets. Um, along the same vein, um, we have detected some of those planets with the radial velocity method. It just takes a lot of time because the orbital periods are so long. Um, and then I, I sort of mentioned at the end with the radial velocity technique, trying to push down towards real earth analogs. So anyway, the, the point being, I think um, this is a question that many, many astronomers are interested in and we're pushing the technology kind of as quickly as possible to get there. Um, uh, my, my prediction is that um, we'll probably have a, or not even probably, I'm fairly certain we'll have a better understanding of whether our solar system architecture is common um, or, or um, whether it's very unique uh, before kind of the chemistry of the planets is, is known to be unique or not, yeah. um, if that makes sense. No, it does. And you're one of the world experts, so it's a great mm -hmm. answer. Um, before we go further, there was a technical question asked, which yeah. is maybe you could expand a little bit on the difference between the Doppler method and the radial velocity method, just because you're going back and forth between those two. And I think there were several questions about that. Sure. So um, the common thing between them is that they're both indirect methods. So in both of these cases, we are not actually observing the planet itself. We're observing stellar light. And so I'll start with the transit technique, which is the second one I talked about. That's where um, you're observing a star and you're looking for small um, uh, changes in the brightness of that star. It gets a little bit dimmer and then goes back to its normal brightness and then gets a little bit dimmer. And that happens um, uh, over time periodically. And if you can see that pattern and measure that small change in brightness precisely enough, then that you can infer the presence of a planet um, that way. And so that's how the Kepler mission worked and how this new mission TESS works and lots of other ground-based surveys as well. The Doppler method um, is also um, looking at a, a star's light, but now instead of just the star getting dimmer or brighter, we're actually trying to measure the motion of a star um, due to the presence of um, a planet that's orbiting it. Um, and so also a very tiny signal, um, but in the, in the transit technique, we're measuring the brightness of the star um, and in the radio velocity technique, um, the, the measurement is really the, the motion or the speed of the star going around um, the common center of mass between the planet and the star. Thank you. So here's another question from the audience, um, which I think is, is, a, is a really good basic science question. So you talked at the beginning about measuring the composition of stars as a way to understanding the, the proto-planetary conditions, the pre-planetary conditions. And the question is really, um, is there going to ever be a, a, a real, a, a clean relationship between the composition of a host mm -hmm. star and the planets uh, the architecture, but maybe even more interesting, you know, the, the actual structure of the planet, the content of the planet, or is it going to be more complex than just understanding the star's composition? Yeah, so this is a super interesting question and a very hot topic right now. There's an active area of research. Um, our kind of first um, understanding that there was a relationship between star and planet composition was um, early on, the first planets that were detected were these giant, you know, hot Jupiter planets. And it was um, determined that those are um, more common around stars that have more metals, which in astronomy speak, is just not, you know, anything other than hydrogen and helium. And so that was more of a trend with the frequency of planets. Um, but yeah, right now people are really interested in trying to model um, the compositions of, of planets, um, interior compositions, and seeing, okay, if I back out, say, the ratio of iron to silicon in the planet, how similar is that to the star? And um, it's sort of mixed results right now. Like I said, this is an active area of research, and how you model the planet, the decisions you make in that, um, there, yeah, there's lots of factors in that. And also um, my, I'm more of an expert in measuring the stellar composition. And um, it was funny, a colleague said to me recently, like, I thought that was a solved problem. Like why, why are people still like, why is this still controversial? Um, but how you measure the stellar composition, um, there's details in that that also can make a difference. 
Um, and so uh, I, yeah, I think, uh, I'm not sure that they'll ever, how much of an exact one-to-one -one relationship there will be. Um, it seems like in some cases there's a, an overlap, but like it, with exactly how much, um, we're, not, we're not sure. So, so I guess stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, stay tuned, right. Right, a, a real goal, I think, of planetary scientists. Yeah. Um, a question about um, how planets uh, form too, which is particularly about Pluto, but it's a more general question, I think, about how planets, uh, how they, be you show these beautiful layered planets and, and how they take the medium around them and become, first of all, layered, but also, why are they spherical? Oh, why are they spherical? Um, yeah. uh, I don't know that I have like a great quick explanation for that. Um, uh, based on what we have observed about the solar system planets, like that's how they yeah. do well. Um, yeah. Just based on what we know about the physics of planet formation, um, we think, yeah, we think planets are spheres. There's also um, in these direct imaging um, cases where there are pictures of planets that also seems to be how they're represented. Um, yeah. But that's different than, you know, other bodies in our solar system, like asteroids or, um, yeah, comets. Um, yeah. So it's not, it's, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. But you'd think all, anything large enough would have to be spherical just because that's sort of the minimum energy when, when you put gravity into the equation. So you right. think that sort of happens. But then they also layer, like, uh, like layers in an oil and vinegar. And presumably it's also similar too, right? The density is, you know, sort of. Move right, like that. right, yeah. right. Um, yeah. And yeah, we, we think, right, the more dense things go to the center of the planet, right. and the right. lighter things are at the top. But yeah. I mean, like I was saying at the, at the beginning, I'm one of the things I'm interested in is how, how much mixing there is between the atmosphere and the interior. That's going to be, you know, volatile composition. Um, but that is still a super open question in the field of, of exoplanets. Yeah, so um, here's another interesting question, which I know you're very interested in, which is how, um, well, let me brought, so if you look at uh, planetary atmospheres, um, first of all, how do you look at planetary atmospheres? Mm. What, is, uh, what are the tools you use? How do you look at them? And then what are you looking for when you look at these planetary atmospheres? Yeah, that's a great question. I didn't have time to go over the how part of the exoplanet atmosphere. So, um, but it's, it's good because I explained the transit technique, which is one of the components. Mm -hmm. So um, if we're looking at this planet as it passes between us and the star, we can just observe that small dip in the star's light at um, a specific um, color or wavelength of light. But actually um, we, could, we can use slightly more detailed observations and the starlight, if the planet has an atmosphere, the starlight also passes through the planet's atmosphere to us, the observers, and um, leaves fingerprints of the atoms or molecules in the planet's atmosphere in that observation. Um, and so that's uh, right now kind of the most common way that we measure the compositions of planet atmospheres. It's, it's using that same transit technique, um, but instead of just trying to detect just the signal of the planet, you're looking um, kind of at the next level down um, at um, just the, the atmosphere signal. Mm -hmm. So of course, this is gonna lead me down that golden path to life on other planets. Yeah. So but now that you uh, are starting to have the capability of looking at say more complex, compl or even looking at atmospheres and starting to think about what you yeah. might look at more complex molecules, et cetera, uh, what would you look for if, or, or what would be the signatures that might indicate there's life down there, right? Knowing that you can't get there, knowing that you can't yeah. hear necessarily right on the surface and, and actually take samples, what would you look for in the atmospheres to start telling the rest of the world, well, there might be some life down there? Right, so a common um, idea that's come out of um, the astronomy, but also there's a growing like astrobiology community is looking at uh, signatures of disequilibrium chemistry in the atmosphere, mm -hmm. so, um, and this, I'm not a equilibrium chemistry expert, but basically looking at, okay, based on the temperature and pressure of this planet atmosphere, um, what would you expect the molecules to be and their ratios? And are those, do we observe something that's not um, what we expect? And if so, what could be causing that difference? And one thing that can do that is, is the presence of life. 
Um, but uh, one of the other kind of aspects of, so I, I think probably atmospheric um, detection is going to be the, the most straightforward path to having high confidence detections of, of life on other planets, but trying to figure out where to look and, and how to interpret those molecular detections, um, I think is going to, like I sort of alluded to at the end, require this, this refining of the definition of habitability to really include things like, um, you know, does how likely is the planet to have plate tectonics or volcanism and how could that be impacting the atmosphere? And so understanding the planet sort of holistically um, and that's one of the, the research um, areas that we're really interested in at EPL. I think we're gonna need that component as well to um, interpret the very limited astronomical data. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the, uh, uh, a follow on question to that then, is, and this is gonna use your, your great predictive capabilities as a great Carnegie scientist. Um, you know, now that these new tools are coming online, at least within the next decade, so you've talked about tests, which is specifically designed to look at exoplanets, basically discover them in a survey way. Uh, you mentioned the Magellan Telescope and you showed the giant Magellan Telescope and extremely large telescopes, which should be able to really start peering into these atmospheres. Do you think um, in, let's say in my lifetime, the next 20 years, we're gonna be able to prove that uh, life exists on other planets? I think that's iffy. Um, I, I think in the next few decades, um, but I don't know whether that's two or four, <laughs> um, yeah. but I, but I would say, I mean, I, I hope, I hope within something like three or four decades, um, that that would be possible. I will also say, I mean, of course, my area of interest is, is exo and area of expertise is in exoplanets, but our solar system is also, very interesting, right? We had the these yeah. detections possibly of phosphine and Venus recently, and and so yeah. Um, yeah. it's kind of a race between do exoplanets find some evidence of life, you know, other than Earth, or does do the solar system scientists? And I think they might win. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. um, let's bring this down to Earth again. There was a question um, about the impact of the pandemic on your ability to uh, to do the survey you're doing. Uh, right, this MTS survey. Uh, we talked about this just before we went online here. Uh, maybe you can say a few words about how you and maybe astronomers more generally are being impacted by this. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, our survey was originally designed to be three years. <clears throat> um, I never specified the number of semesters that we would be observing. I just thought those would be consecutive semesters. Um, but what what's happened is um, in actually um, right before um, sort of everything shut down. Um, we were actually in the middle of a PFS observing run last March. And um, the people who were observing kind of just got out of Chile in time to come back to the US before really it was much more difficult to travel. Uh, and from, yeah, the spring to uh, October, mid-October, both the Magellan telescopes were, in fact, the whole Las Campanas Observatory was just shut down. Um, and so no observations. Um, this was generally true for most of the observatories in Chile. Um, they sort of, uh, in the fall, sort of um, so started opening up again slowly. Um, but actually just this week, um, one of the Magellan telescopes also shut down again. Um, very thankfully, it's not due to any COVID cases on the mountain, but just um, it's precautionary since cases are rising. So, I mean, generally the, the effect for astronomers or observational astronomers at least is um, extended timelines for projects. And um, for our project, that's not as big of a deal because it's really a survey. And um, if the results come out, you know, a year later than intended or originally planned, um, I think they'll still be just as impactful. But for people who are doing time domain observations or um, graduate students who have much more constrained deadlines, um, I, I think that is a big, a big negative impact. Um, but I think from everyone that I've talked to has said, this is disappointing, but like 110% safety first. Uh, we want the people at our observatories who, who make our science possible to be safe. Yeah, that's great. Um, and it's great that it's all hopefully slowly this year it'll come back. So we're all waiting for that vaccine. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I uh, would, I'll say um, one really remarkable thing is that 
um, up until October of last year, whenever I was observing at, at Las Campanas, I was there in person. Um, and now they've really um, set up a very successful uh, remote observing framework so that I can observe from my apartment and you know, just with a good internet connection and a, and a laptop and a nice big monitor that helps too. Um, but uh, yeah. that has been super helpful. Yeah. So here's another somewhat technical question, but I think it's a really good one, which is that, uh, as you've already said, many of these solar systems have multiple planets. So how does that affect um, your Doppler methods? So how does that affect, because presumably oh. each of these planets has a complex relationship or not complex, but a Keplerian relationship, but it must complicate individual planet measurements. Yeah, so it, how do you, how yeah. do you deconvolve all that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it definitely complicates things. Um, for our survey, um, we have a big advantage in that because TESS is detecting the planets, we know um, the period of the planet ahead of time. We know that it's there and we know um, sort of the pattern that we should see in the radial velocity um, observations. So that um, not all of the components of this model are free parameters. Whereas if you don't have that prior information, um, it becomes much more, more challenging. And I've sort of found um, through, through my work that doubling or tripling the number of planets in a system you need much more than double or triple the amount of radial velocity data to yeah. be able to, to pick out those planets um, because yeah. of um, uh, because of their interactions, and so uh, it just makes them more challenging systems, but but also very interesting, um, and uh, especially for this idea of trying to understand the compositions of planets. And, and like going back to one of the earlier questions, how that depends on the host star. Well, if we have multiple planets in the system, the host star and it's sort of how the star evolved over time, that's a constant between all of those planets. Um, and so in formation evolution models that might make it easier to um, investigate other processes that are impacting the planet composition. Yeah. Um... That's great. Uh, there's so many questions. Uh, I, sorry, I can't answer, can't ask them all of you, Johanna. But we, you know, we can get to these offline. So if sure. you haven't had uh, those in the audience who haven't had their questions answered, I apologize. But we have a whole lot of great questions. And maybe you can say a little bit about, um, you know, you've talked about optical telescopes. You know, you talked about TESS and the, the Las Campanas telescopes. But you know, as we know, there's a whole range of ways of observing uh, objects in the sky. There's radio telescopes. There's X-rays. Uh, and now we have LIGO, so we have gravity waves. Um, can you just say a bit about how those fit into, you know, for example, radio waves and, uh, you know, and, and some of the big radio telescopes, uh, in particular ALMA and also in Chile, does that impact um, and, and enable you um, from a technical point of view to illuminate some of the problems you're looking at? So at least in my research so far, not in a very direct way, but in a very important indirect way, which is ALMA has completely revolutionized um, our the information, the data that we have to test the planet formation models and really looking at the earlier phases of, you know, I'm looking at fully formed planets, but how, how do they get to be um, and how do they interact with their gas and dust disks? Um, and what is the time scale? Are planets forming sort of very late um, in the, the, you know, after the star has been around for a while or very early? And ALMA has um, just given us a wealth of information about that. Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, I just uh, said this was maybe a question, but, but um, I think ALMA has really shown us that planet formation seems to start very early. And so mm -hmm. um, trying to factor that into my own understanding of, okay, if, if um, yeah, I'm trying to understand the differences between super and sub-Neptunes, um, that difference, uh, when did that happen on the timeline? And so, yeah, in, in an indirect way, it's been very interesting um, uh, that the radio observations in particular. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was also a question about magnetic fields, which is also an interesting thing to yes. detect. And you know, is one of the things that is now a, a major speculation is that magnetic, you know, we know in our own solar system, some planets have it, some don't. Mm -hmm. Earth has it, Jupiter has it, Mars doesn't. And there's, of course, speculation that without a magnetic field, you can't have life because magnetic right. fields effectively shield us from harmful radiation. Um, what are the prospects of thinking about looking at 
you know, if, if you're looking at the planet itself, you're looking at the atmosphere that's connected to the planet, but are there things you can look at that directly couple to the planets, the exoplanets themselves to give you insight? So a magnetic field probably means there's a molten core and that there's, you know, there's a dynamo, but are there, you know, in, in this solar system, we've measured those magnetic fields on other planets, mm -hmm. but can you imagine that that's going to be possible uh, for exoplanets? Um, so right now, the um, kind of the focus of detecting magnetic fields, I mean, similar to exoplanets, you start kind of with the, the biggest things and, and work your way down. And so there's a lot of work right now trying to detect um, the evidence of magnetic fields around brown dwarfs which are kind of these weird, but very interesting objects between stars and planets that probably are analogs for um, giant planet, giant exoplanets. Um, there has been um, over time evidence suggesting interactions between stars and planets, their um, potential magnetic interactions. Um, so that's sort of indirect evidence. Um, so I think I mean, you're, you're right on that, whether smaller terrestrial planets have magnetic fields is gonna be really important for understanding their current and, and past and future habitability. Um, I don't know the, what's gonna be the path to getting there at this point. Um, I think there's still a lot we have to learn from the more, the, the um, ground dwarfs and, and giant exoplanets. Great, so I think we're coming close to the end. Um, Maybe I'll ask one more question, um, which is to allow you to speculate at the end of the talk as to why, uh, I asked you earlier why uh, we might not be unique. Would you speculate as to why we're not, why our own solar system uh, is, is diff so different? Why do we have uh, the, you know, these earth-sized planets that um, like Mars and earth that are, are habitable and, right. and, and, and hold life. So, you know, reflecting on what might be out there. Yeah. So why would be, why would we end up this way? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a question that I want to try to answer. Um, <laughs> I think a, a key factor in this is going to be the role of giant planets. Those, I mean, Jupiter had such a large role in shepherding material around in our solar system and, and thus probably the compositions of the terrestrial planets. And so actually one um, question that I'm really interested in for the super earths is, and some Neptunes is, it seems like some, some fraction of like 30% have Jupiter analog um, uh, planets in their system, but then the rest of them don't. And so I wanna know, um, are the small planets, small exoplanets that have Jupiter analogs, are they different in their composition in some way? Um, because I think that is um, getting at whether this, this role of Jupiter in our solar system is very similar in, in exoplanetary systems. So I think that's, that's one step along that path, but there are many other steps to go. <laughs> well, thank you, Johanna, for a really wonderful talk about what I think is one of the more exciting topics. Uh, we're delighted you came and stayed at Carnegie, and we're delighted that you're, you're joining a long legacy of, of research and in discovering and understanding these planets in our own solar system and beyond. So thank you for joining us today. I also wanna thank our audience and uh, all of the participants for your great questions, for your participation in, our, in this and hopefully future virtual lectures. So thanks for joining us. And I'll hope you join us on February 24th when one of our other new hires, Phil Cleves, will talk about symbiosis in corals and some of the studies he's doing in, uh, in the wild, like in the Great Barrier Reef. So thanks again for coming and we'll see you soon.